Thank you all very much for sharing your view and CyberArk view of the safe move to the cloud. Now I would like to, uh, to invite uh, Iftah uh, Ian Amit, who is Senior Manager of Security Engineering in Amazon, to share his view on the cloud and the move to the cloud. Thanks for uh, keeping awake in this rough hour after lunch. Today I want to talk to you about security, uh, old school security actually. The cloud is just a new version of our old servers that used to be in our basements, in our racks, in our closets, in data centers. Um, and in some sense I get the feeling that we somewhat lost touch with what's the meaning of truly doing security. Just a quick disclaimer, as Michal said, this is my view of, uh, of security. It's got nothing to do with, with my employer. I have to put this out there just to make sure that no, no one is, uh, is hurt. Uh, but let's start with a quick demo. I'd like you to see how many elements uh, of problematic security you see in the following video. Do we have sound? Family, you're not the master of the universe, Mike. We'll see how tough you are. And your little planes start falling out of the sky. Until we can clean out the hack, everything's grounded. You have any evidence that he's actually done any of these things? Change everything. Password, it's code. Secure this place. The pictures you take, the things you put out there, they can be used to hurt you. Privacy's over, Mike. It's a whole new world now. When I cut this video, uh, I suddenly realized that I know and I have friends who have been practicing each and every part of the hacking scenes that you've seen. Uh, some of them are actually here uh, in the crowd, so watch out. But I'm not here to really scare you. I'm here just to make a point about how connected we've become. Everything is now connected. Our phones, our social lives, our business lives, uh, our home entertainment, our home automation, our cars, everything is really connected to each other uh, and we can add more connectivity and more services on top of those to make our lives easier, to make our, works, our work more effective and easier, uh, and just to enhance our day-to-day our -day life and even social lives. Uh, but that comes with some kind of burden. And the real burden is where is all that data? Can anyone really know where each and every piece of data, where each and every piece of information that we're generating, that we're processing, accumulating, passing along, is really saved. Where is that data? Uh, in the old times, we used to have floppy disks and, and hard drives that we know that data is over there. It's a very closed network, it's a closed system, and we, we at least had the feeling that we have control over where that data is. In our days, with distributed systems, uh, systems that are available 24-7 in multiple areas of the world, we don't really know where, our, where our, our data resides. And that poses a big problem, a big question about how do we secure that data? How do we address it? How do we make sure that we grant the right access and deny the wrong access to the data that we generate? And what is really the data? Because there's a lot of metadata that goes around it. As anyone knows, uh, anyone who's ever taken a picture on their, their phone, it's not just the pixels that compose the, the, the visual imagery. There's a lot of metadata that comes with it, that is carried away with it uh, through whatever service we upload that picture to. Uh, and it's a big question. How do we treat that data? How do we really secure that data? And let's say that you do know, or, or do you think you know, where that data resides. What does that really mean? Do you know what are the legal implications of storing data in one country versus another? Again, if, if we assume that you actually know where that data resides. Do you know how to protect it? Do you know what happens if you lose data or if someone steals that data? 
it really depends on where that data resides uh, in terms of what your reaction should be and what your activities should be, and that should factor in to your disaster recovery plan and incident response plan. And I'm not really sure that everyone really understands the full implications of it. So when we are putting data out in the cloud, when we are using third-party services to process our data, we need to take that into account. We need to do the proper mapping of how do we treat that. And data, very much like you know, animals flocking and like people going places, does not want to stay in one place. Every time we consume, every time we connect another service to enhance our, our lives, to enhance the connectivity, that, that big network of things connected to things, every time we do that, we open up an exponential kind of complexity of where, the, where does that data reside? Can you provide me the assurances that a service that you think is just processing your data doesn't keep it somewhere? Uh, and if it doesn't, maybe it just rolls up and summarizes that. That's also something that we need to take into account. How does that affect me? Do I need to account for it? Do I need to put you know, legal bounds around it or treat it differently? It's a big question. And it really boils down back to the fact that we as security professionals haven't been doing that great. And you're seeing a lot of products out there and you're hearing a lot of people focusing on providing products to protect the digital, the digital element of our businesses, of our organizations, of our people and individuals. But they often forget that as security professionals, we're not just tasked to deal with a digital element. It does not live by itself. Michal mentioned it before. It's not about the silos of having products protect the digital realm. It's about making sure that we account for everything around it, including the physical and the social. And as any red teamer would tell you, red teaming is not about you know, poking and prodding on a firewall or stealing a password or some credentials. It's about simulating an adversary, a real adversary, that is not limited to the scope of a security control, to the scope of a security product. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what keeps creating the gap, what keeps providing attackers with a competitive advantage over defenders. That gap, in turn, is being filled, or supposedly filled, by security products, and we have been kind of indoctrinated to just click on them, to install them, to say, oh yeah, that sounds right, that sounds like something that we should have, add more products, while what we're actually doing is filling the digital controls, and we're forgetting about the entire uh, fabric of what an attacker sees. In companies, again, this is you know, what, what they used to have. They used to have control. Uh, and much like everyone who's traveled to the US, uh, and, and ran across the TSA, those kind of controls are no more than a security theater. It's a feel-good button, all right? It, it's a feel-good kind of mechanism. I have the data, I can see it. And as Michal mentioned before, the new norm is really moving to the cloud, is moving to a facility that can secure your infrastructure better, I actually disagree with some of the statements said before that it's more complicated and more complex. You know what? I think it's, it's less complicated than spinning up a new server, one of these, that usually used to take you about eight to 12 weeks. All right? Now you can do it in, in five seconds. So it's really a matter of taking the skills that we learned when we were younger, when we just started in this business, and applying them again to this new environment. Nothing has really changed. The only thing that changes is the technology, and that's easy. But at some point, we forgot that we need to keep applying the basics of security to this new technology. So with this you know, new cloud and everyone moving over to the cloud, we have to remember that the basics still matter. Mapping, basic mapping of what do I have. A lot of companies miss out on that willy-nilly, you know, setting up servers, setting up networks, and forgetting that there are implications. Every server that you create, every service that you connect into that server, every third-party company, every piece of code that you consume or use in your environment 
needs to be mapped and fully understood in terms of what is my fabric that I'm now protecting, both the physical, the social, and the digital that I have to account for. It really is going back to the basics. And if we look back, this is what we used to do. This is nothing new. Even when we used to set up data centers and rack servers and connect networks, this is what we did. We took account of inventory. We took account of what is the perimeter. What is my attack surface? We locked those servers physically in place. We locked down that facility. We made sure that only certain people have access. The same still applies. It's just a different technology. That's it. It's really not that complicated. I know I'm supposed to scare you and tell you, oh, the cloud is the new thing, and it's, you know, you need to get certifications and to learn everything about it, but really, security people still do the same basic things. We need to make sure that we're making life easier, not more complicated. You don't need the wizardry of launching a new service and securing it, like in the old days. When you, when you had to you know, re-rack the production server versus the beta one, when you had to retest things, there's no wizardry. We're eliminating a lot of the, the, the hard work that we used to do 10, 15, 20 years ago as security professionals because the new technology allows us to do it faster, more efficiently. We need to keep simplifying that. We need to keep inventing on top of the technologies that we have, on top of the cloud, on top of whatever's gonna come up next. And my message is really go back to basics. Be able to create a, a, a proper mapping of your assets, know where your data is at, know what you're using, what services, what third parties, what components. Create a threat model, really basic. When I run into a CISO or anyone who's dealing with security, my first question is, what is your threat model? What are the assets that you're protecting? The business ones, not the technology ones. Who are your threats? And how do you account for them? What kind of controls are you putting, putting in place? Again, not just the technology controls, your actual controls. They may include some tech products. And this, these are the kind of questions that we as security professionals need to keep asking and to put in context, even when we're dealing with those newfangled technologies. And again, they're not really new. They're the new norm. So that's what I have for you. Thank you very much. Back to Michal.